Now we talk a lot around here about my personal favorite designer, of course, Carl Alberg, and for good reason. If you like a long, full keel sail around the world safely sort of a boat that'll stand on its own in just about anything the world's oceans have to offer, you undoubtedly know the name Carl Alberg. And Alberg's name isn't just on his own line of boats, like my holy grail boat, the Alberg 30, I'm in love with this thing, and his other self-named boats, like the Alberg 22, all the way up to the Alberg 37, but the Alberg name is also on some other boats, like Bristol, Ensign, Ericsson, Hinkley, Odyssey, the Sea Sprite, South Coast, Triton, the Mighty Triton, and the Typhoon. Carl Alberg's name is also on a boat we haven't talked about here yet. A boat you can still buy today in fairly good shape if you look around that will also take you just about anywhere your little sailor heart desires. This week on Everything You Need to Know, we're talking about Dory. No, not that Dory. Cape Dory. Now Carl Alberg, we have to start with him when we talk about Cape Dory. Carl was born in Sweden in 1901, and he immigrated to the U.S. And to think about what sort of an incredible life he experienced. World War I, the Great Depression, the Dust Bowl, World War II. He got into the sailboat game, too, at a really pivotal time. They were still making wood boats. In fact, his designs over at Pearson were the spearhead of the fiberglass revolution when it came to sailboats. And we have Carl Albert to thank for many of the advancements we enjoy in our boats today. Cape Dory, on the other hand, is a name that if you live outside the U.S., there's a good chance you've never heard of. I hadn't heard of Cape Dory until I started sailing U.S. waters, where I started to run into them in about New York, and I ended up seeing them all the way down the East Coast and well into the Bahamas. Our story today is about Andrew Vavalotis? Vavalotis? I think that's Greek. And while not much is written about Andrew and his pre-sailboat manufacturer life, here's what we do know. Andrew set out to build a sailing dinghy in his garage. And his concept was to build it entirely with his own two hands and build it the best he possibly could. Not just build a good boat, but build a boat the best a boat could possibly be built in the mid-60s. His project in his garage when he finished it was a sturdy, durable 10-foot hull that would meet the needs of almost any sailor that wanted such a thing, and he based it off the rowing dinghies that he had seen growing up around Cape Cod. He had his own tweaks to the design, and when it was done, he called it the Cape Dory. Now, if you're a regular viewer of this channel, you probably think this sounds a little bit familiar. Almost all the brands we talk about the same way. A guy in his garage building sailing dinghies takes it a step farther and turns it into a boat building company. And Andy's story is no different. From the first little Cape Dory he finished in his garage in 1964, he branched out and opened a manufacturing facility in Massachusetts to produce thousands of boats, all the way up to 45 feet. And he even did power boats and trawlers. So the first boat, the Cape Dory 10, you can find this all over the world now. 10 and a half feet long, four feet wide, two foot centerboard, only weighs 150 pounds. So it's a really easy boat to own. It's a really easy boat to make use of on any body water that has a breeze. And they made over 2000 of them. So from 1964 to 1983, there's a lot of them out there. They're not exactly hard to find. So after the 10-footer was very successful, what do you do? You build a bit bigger boat. So they built a 14, which was basically just a beefier 10. Um, it was 200 pounds instead of 150. Instead of a two-foot centerboard, you got three feet. They only made about 700 of them, though, so they're going to be a bit harder to find. But needless to say, the 10 and the 14 are not only overbuilt and hard to break, but they also tow as a tender very easy. They sail really well for what they are. They row really easily, and when you need a break, you can send the kids out in them because they're just really easy to manage. Lady K Sailing is brought to you by patrons, uh, people who give a couple of bucks an episode to make this whole channel possible. I want to give a big thank you to all of the Lady K patrons out there, and a shout out to the newest to join the team. We've got BHG and Texas Turf. Thank you guys so much for making it possible. So after the success of the sailing dinghies that he was building and founding the company Cape Dory, Andy set his sights into 
the bigger sailboat market and wanted to build sort of a weekender sailboat for people to buy. That was sort of where the money was. His mantra of building rock solid boats done the right way the first time, he would need an extremely rugged design. And in the late 60s, there was really one name for that, Carl Alberg. So Andy and Carl got together and they got a Kraken and they made the Typhoon series of boats, which a lot of you have heard of. They made some 2000 of these things. This was an 18 foot hull weighing about 2000 pounds. It was solid glass underneath, balsa core deck with a fractional rig and a monster full keel. The Albert way, with the rudder hung off the keel so you couldn't break it. Should be noted that the Cape Dory Sailboat Owners Association is still functioning and they still support the Typhoon series of boats with an active club racing membership and a huge support system on the internet. So finding help if you have an 18 foot Cape Dory won't be a problem. Sailing Magazine called the Typhoon one of America's best loved small boats. Another Typhoon owner, Frank Hall, described it in an interview as handling exceptionally well when the wind increased to 15 to 20 knots. This is an 18 foot boat. He said the biggest wind he saw sailing his 18-foot Typhoon was 20 to 23 knots in a race. Um, he had one reef in the jib and a full main. He said it was just a moderate heel and it handled extremely well with only a little bit of weather, weather helm to windward. In the 1980s, we saw the production of the 22-footer, a little bit bigger. It was still trailerable, just over 3,000 pounds. And again, the full keel Albert was famous for. You wouldn't be alone if you mistake the Cape Dory 22 for the Alberg 22, though, they're kind of close sisters. The next size up, of course, you get a Cape Dory 25, and although it looked like a blown up version of the Alberg Design 22, it was actually penned by somebody completely different. The designer was George Stadel. In the 25, you got full on sloop rigged, long keel boat again, with a head this time, weighing in at about 4,000 pounds to keep you safe. They made almost a thousand of the 25, so you should be able to find one of those if you want one. Back on the Alberg design side of things, the next major success was the Cape Dory 28. We're getting into some bigger boats now. It was a familiar 9,000 pounds with a 9 foot beam and a full keel with an inboard this time, which is starting to sound like an Alberg 30. Speaking of, they also did a Cape Dory 30 that you could get in a sloop or a catch. Very Alberg 30. The 30 is the last major production run Cape Dory had before closing up shop in 1992, and 2,000 of them were made. The all too familiar Carl Alberg Mark I version of the 30 that they started in 1976, but then a whole different Cape Dory 30 started in 1986. That's the Mark II. So if the Mark I was basically just an Alberg 30 with some tweaks, the Mark II is a whole different beast. It's a foot and a half wider to give you that interior space. It's got more waterline to give you more speed. It's a much more modern looking boat with sharper angles around the coach top and to me has sort of an O'Day feel to how it looks. One interesting thing that Cape Dory was sort of famous for was not bothering with gasoline engines in their boats, the inboard boats, after about 1975. If you got an inboard Cape Dory, you got a diesel and honestly, I'm not mad about it. The Atomic 4 has famously been in everything from tractors to sailboats, but I wouldn't be upset if I never had to work on one again. I could probably rebuild one blindfolded at this point. We of course can't talk about Cape Dory without talking about the one you'd actually likely buy and go cruising on today. And for many, there's two of them. There's the 33 and the 36. These are the workhorses for the Caribbean live aboard cruiser sort of market. You get full keels as you do with most of these boats. You get solid and much thicker than needed glass hulls, no core in the hull. And typical of the time you get the balsa core deck, which by this point is going to have some water intrusion in it, hopefully not beyond repair if you can find one. These hulls tend to be a bit tender at first, it's how they're designed, until they heal over enough to pick up several feet of water line and then they just sort of stop healing. That's where they like to be and they get very comfortable and solid. The downside is, as it is with any Carl Alberg design boat, the long and skinny of it all. By the standards of designers like Robert Perry that took over in the 80s, these boats were just too skinny to give you enough room inside the cabin. Many of them were less than 10 feet wide, some nine feet wide 
which translates to probably about eight feet usable space inside, that's amazingly and unreasonably skinny by what you'd expect in a boat today. The Cape Dory line started to fade away after the 30 and the 33 and the 36 with some very small production runs of a few power boats and a few trawlers and they actually built three examples of the Cape Dory 45 footer which you'd be hard pressed to find they're very very rare some claims to fame however note that the Cape Dory 25D has been single-handed across the Atlantic from New York to Ireland and across the Pacific from Cali to Australia which is not bad for a 25 foot boat the 28 is also famous for circumnavigations solo. When they folded up in 1992, the designs went off to Newport Marine, but they folded in 1996. From there, the molds went to Robin Hood Marine, though, which was headed by a familiar name, Andy Vivolitis, which he continued building them as sort of custom boats, which is pretty cool, so you can still get them. That's it for this week, guys. If you like this episode, please give it a thumbs up. If you want to hear about your boat in a future episode, leave it in the comments. I will see you guys next week. Keep the heavy side down. Bye.